All right, 47 from 5.8, right? Hey, now there's an A, B, and C there. I was going to ask that something. Well, what, what do you need to see? I guess I got your email about Part B. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at it. I don't just saying that they need to say that. But please come see it. Let me just show you what I was thinking, Ms. Um, Cheryl. It seems like when you emailed me, you were thinking A is 1 and U is X. Okay, and that's a reasonable thing to think until you realize, oh, but then it's not going to just be, you were thinking maybe it was art sign. Yeah, and then I thought, oh, you just can't do it. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, if it was art sign, then that X couldn't be there. You don't have anything to put in place of that X. Were you about to say something, Emma? I was just going to say that I Okay, all right, tell me. Um, I made you the part inside the rabbit. The rabbit Yep, that works. Yeah, I, I, I saw you doing that. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so if u is 1 minus x squared, then du is negative 2x dx, right? And to integrate that, I could integrate, this is u to what power? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not actually one of that few women, but minus x squared to the negative one half. And in order to integrate u to the negative one half, I have to have du right beside it. So du is negative two x dx. But that's not equivalent to the line above it unless I do what? Right. And you can finish it now, right? Okay, what else? Yes, ma'am. 37. <laughs> Give me your whole thought process on that, Sam. Okay, so factor out a negative two. Mm -hmm. Did you factor it out of all three terms or just the first two terms? Just the first two. Yeah, it's a the reason that I'm thinking just the first two terms is I'm thinking this is probably gonna be complete the square. And to complete the square, I just complete the square on the x squared plus x term. Here's what I thought. If I factor a negative 2 out of the first two terms, that'll give me x squared minus 4x. Um, yes. <clears throat> and then the plus 4. Something just... So far, so good. Because if I put the plus 4 inside, I could put the plus 4 inside as long as I did something to balance it outside. If I had the plus 4 inside the parentheses, then I really wouldn't be adding 4. I'd be subtracting 8. So I'd have to add 8 outside the parentheses. Which is probably what I should have done. This just takes one more step if I don't realize that to begin with. Um, what can you add inside the bracket or inside the parentheses to complete the square? Mm -hmm. 
half of 4 is 2, 2 squared is 4. But then you have to realize, hey, I really haven't added 4 because everything inside the parentheses is multiplied by negative 2. I've really subtracted 8. And so I have to add 8 to balance that out. Okay, right here. Um, I know that to balance or to complete the square, I don't need that constant. I just complete the square on an x squared plus something x or an x squared minus something, something x. So I only factor the negative 2 out of the first two terms. And then I said, what do I have to add inside that parentheses to complete the square? Half of 4 is 2. 2 squared is 4. So I added 4 inside the parentheses. But that's not really all I did under the radical because everything that is inside parentheses is multiplied by negative 2. Yes, I didn't really add 4. I really subtracted 8. And I to add 8 so that it's still the line above it. And then, good morning. Good morning. That factors into a perfect square, and I knew it would. That's why I completed the square. It factors into x minus 2 squared plus 12. And that still doesn't look like one of my inverse trig functions unless I do what? Yeah. If you rewrite it as square root of 12 minus 2 times x minus 2 squared, all of a sudden it looks like a, um, a squared and a u squared. Because this 4 that I added to complete the square was multiplied by negative 2. So I really didn't add 8, I really subtracted 8 and had to balance it by adding 8. Now, before I leave that one to let you finish, um, if it is in the form now a squared minus u squared, then what is the, um, the a would be what? Square root of 12, and the u would be what? It has to be the thing that's squared to give you this. Yes. It is just this. <laughs> and if that is u, then I have to have du beside it, which would be what? Square root of 2 dx. And so all I lack in having exactly square root of a squared minus u squared du is a square root of 2 in the numerator. So I'm going to multiply outside the interval by 1 over square root of 2. Our sum. We just finish it with the formula now. Yeah, I saved up with this. Right? I was in this right all I should have that one. I don't see how it's going to look. Did they rationalize the denominator? Or not? They did something with like the u over a because I ended up with the square root of 6 times x minus 2 over 6. It's but since I look at my answer with the square root of 2 x minus 2 over the square root of 12, it might end up simplifying to that. Oh, okay. Um, yes, at first I did not rationalize the denominator. 
And then when I looked in the back, I said, oh yeah, I could multiply that plus 32 was 32, and that plus 36 was 36. So that's how the answer's written in the back of the book. Yeah. Test-wise, either one of those is perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I think my allergies are... It's about time to start taking Zyrtec again. <laughs> um, I have been taking it every day for a few years now, and then I read something about um, certain allergy medicines when taken daily for years increase your chance for dementia by like 700 percent. I don't want no, to be <laughs> 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 I won't be able to teach. Yes. Okay, 41. Is it okay if we just do the uh, antiderivative without the, the definite integral? Probably, yeah. But surely you can plug in a 3 and a 2 if you need to. Mm -hmm. is u to the one half, is that close to being du? Well, du would be negative 2x plus 4. So maybe I could multiply by negative 1 and figure out, you know, figure out how to make that negative 2x plus 4. But if I didn't want to go that route, then I would be thinking exactly the same thing you did. And you should be able to get the answer either way. You're saying I can turn that around and factor out a negative 1, and you have negative x squared minus 4x, and then you can figure out what to add inside the parentheses to complete the square. All right, what did you add? Uh, plus Half of 4 is 2, 2 squared is 4. I've added 4 inside parentheses, but what have I really done? So to balance that, I have to add 4. Turn that rather hand around like we did on the previous problem. We would have 4 minus x minus 2 squared. And I'm thinking, is that arc sign also? It does look like it. If 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 a is four and u is x minus two, then how in the world are we going to get that two x minus three? Put it into two fractions. Um, that's the third way we could do this problem. I think we've come up with three different ways we could do it. Um, if we split it into two different fractions, let me think about that though. It should work, but this is a squared minus u squared. Oh, I bet you let something, did you let u be the x minus two, or did you let it be the whole radical hand? Oh, okay. All right. Well, the reason it's not just arc sine is because arc sine would not have that 2x minus 3 in the numerator. It would just have the derivative of x minus 2. So. Can you split it like if you use arc sine mm -hmm. for one part? Yep. And then the part of the 2x, I would like 
There's an X there. I don't know what to do. Okay. Um, I forgot to give my computer its cup of coffee this morning. So let's try that. so good. And this will be the part that ends up being arc sine because I can bring the 3 out in front of the integral sine. But what about that um, first one? I think of anything. Yes, because if I let the whole radicand be u, then what's du? negative 2x. Well, I have a positive 2x. It wouldn't take much to get a negative 2x. I left off both of my dx's. If I put a negative outside that first radical, then I could think of this as being 4 minus x minus 2 squared times negative 2x dx. And I'm going to move that before I go any further. Uh, that's to the negative 1 half. minus x minus 2 squared to negative 1 half. Negative 2x dx. So we're going to line of the Second term. I'm going to bring that 3 out front and just have 1 over square root of 4 minus x minus 2 squared. So what am I looking when I think of that, look at that first term now? Bring down the negative and what the heck is that? second it was. But now it's just u to the negative one half. So add one to the exponent. Oh, I don't need the integral sign anymore. Add one to the exponent would be 4 minus x minus 2 squared 2 to the positive one half dividing by a half is the same as multiplying by 2. the second term. Yes. Arc sine ugly over a and the ugly is x minus 2 plus the a. And then that whole thing is evaluated from x equals 2 to 3 which I would not possibly ask you to do on the test. It would just take too long. Um, I cleaned that up 
before I plug in the three and the two, it will be the same thing. All right, I'm going to put dot, dot, dot just because I don't want to spend time using the fundamental theorem of calculus. All right, we better move on to 5, 9. And gosh darn it, what did we decide about homework? <clears throat> you would finish up 5.9. Just any other questions that you didn't finish after we talked, you would finish it up and I'd take 5, 9 tomorrow. What about 5, 8 today? I mean, besides this problem, Forty-nine. Um, I'm gonna have to. Yeah, I'll I'll have to bump forty-nine to um, Kalanon or early tomorrow because we've got to talk about hyperbolic functions right now. Mm -hmm. We want to get started. Absolutely. Take a picture of your work okay. and send it to me so I can see what's wrong. And um, did I say I would take five eight today because we finished it? Yeah, give me five eight. Oh, this is five eight. Yes, 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 yes. Five seven. You don't have five seven. <laughs> Just okay. Let me let me make this formal homework announcement, and y'all help me remember I made this formal homework announcement. I'm going to take all of five eight tomorrow. All of 5 8 tomorrow. I don't want to take some people's and not others. Um, I yeah. want it out of my hands. No, 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 no. I'm taking pre calculus. I'm taking pre calculus today, so I don't want to. Yeah. All right. The day you've waited for all your life the hyperbolic trig functions. All right. Take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. It's actually going to be pretty easy. Yes. Yes. All right. The trig functions we already know, sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, cotangent, are called circular trigonometric functions because their definitions are in terms of the unit circle. If we have an angle T in standard position, remember standard position means um, centered or beginning at the origin and rotating T degrees or T radians clockwise, then there's a point on that circle whose, which would be some X, Y, and the Y would be the sine of T and the X would be the cosine of T. So far so good? All right. What's the equation of the unit circle? And since it's the unit circle, what does x squared plus y squared equal? It's yes, yeah. You weren't giving me the whole. You weren't giving me the whole equation. You were just giving me the left hand side. Since the radius is one, then the equation of the unit circle is x squared plus y squared equals one. And what's the first Pythagorean identity? Sine. I'm going to write. I'm going to write cosine first, just because I'm making a point here. Cosine square um, t. T is the angle that um, is the radian measure of the angle we're talking about. Cosine square t plus sine square t equals one. And the cosine t is the x. And the sine t is the y, so really those two equations are saying the same thing. All right, that's our circular trig functions. Did you know there are hyperbolic trig functions? <laughs> if, if circular trig functions are based on a circle, guess what hyperbolic trig functions are based on? Hyperbolas. Hyperbolas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, hyperbolas. Their definitions are in terms of a unit hyperbola. What's the difference between the equation of this circle and the equation of the unit hyperbola? 
Mm -hmm. Well, I need a whole equation. What's the difference between, if you're just looking at a bunch of equations how, that some of them are circles and some of them are hyperbolas, how do you tell the difference, which ones are circles and which ones are hyperbolas? Mm -hmm. um, so do hyperbolas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, x, the circle, the x squared and the y squared, both have to have positive coefficients. With a hyperbola, one of them is going to have a negative coefficient. So x squared minus y squared equals 1 is the unit hyperbola. Well, let's, let's graph the unit hyperbola and then label a point on it like we have a point on our unit circle. Um, when you're graphing the unit hyperbola, Remember what's under the x square and the y square? That's your a and your b. And you go to the left, a and b, to the right, a and b. So I'm going to go left one, right one, up one, down one. And if I just connected those four points, it would be the unit circle. But to graph the unit hyperbola, I put in the corners of the fundamental rectangle. Fundamental square. And then what? When we're graphing the hyperbola. It's been a long time. The asymptotes go through the corners. Those are called the Those are called the asymptotes of the fundamental um, rectangle of a hyperbola. <laughs> it does go out sideways, but it's not that thing. Yeah. Um, that's supposed, it's supposed to have gone through the origin. I didn't eyeball it quite right, but is the fundamental hyperbola. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you just wait. You just wait. That is the fundamental hyperbola. That's an odd graph. Oh, I didn't do a great job of it, but yeah, that's that's basically a fundamental hyperbola. Why do we do if it were y squared minus x squared, then it would be a concave up and concave down hyperbola. Whichever, um, whichever variable is negative tells you which way the, or whichever one's positive tells you how the hyperbola opens. If it's your x squared that's positive, it's a left-right hyperbola. If it's your y squared that's positive, it's a up-down hyperbola. So this is our hyperbola, and there's some point on it If our point on the unit circle is cosine t sine t, then, but this is a hyperbolic trig function rather than a circular trig function, then that point is hyperbolic cosine hyperbolic sine. Here's how you write it. Cosine h is hyperbolic cosine. T is still the angle, T radius. That's cosh T, sinh T. It's just the name of that point. It's still an X and a Y, but because it's a point on the fundamental hyperbola rather than a point on the fundamental, or you, I said that wrong. Because it's a point on the unit hyperbola rather than a point on the unit circle, it's hyperbolic cosine t, hyperbolic sine t. Also pronounced cosh and cinch. Um, that is any point, just like 
no matter which point we labeled on the unit circle, it would be cosine t, sine t for a different angle t. This is any point on the unit hyperbola is a cosine or cosh t, sinh t for some t. All right. So if that is our ordered pair, guess what the first identity of hyperbolic functions is? Cosh squared t, sinh squared t. Why cosh? This is a hyperbola. Oh. Yeah. Oh, t, t. Cosh squared t minus six squared t equals one. The only way that this could be any more fun is if somehow it had e's and i's. Oh, well, look, it does. It's just a party to the. It is. It was. On pajama day, I pull out hyperbolic functions just to remind you that you're a grown up. <laughs> All right. Rather amazingly, a formula proved by Leonard Euler, the same guy who said I is the square root of negative one just because he wanted to. <laughs> he needed something, so he said, I'm going to call this the imaginary unit. In 1748, shows the relationship between trigonometric functions and the complex exponential function e to the i x. i is an imaginary number. This is e, like 2.71828, on and on and on, to the i imaginary number x. Who even thought there was a relationship between the trigonometric functions and the complex exponential functions? First you... First, you have to realize that there is a complex exponential function, and then how the heck does that relate to trigonometry at all? It's above my head. I can't show you. I can point you toward a video in Khan Academy that if you really want to know, you can watch that, but my head just kind of... I, Euler's formula states that, holy cow, e to the i x is cosine x plus sine x. So for any angle of radian measure x, cosine x plus the imaginary number i times sine x gives you the same thing as e to the i x. He was way smarter than me. Even crazier, even crazier, Euler's identity states that e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. I just trust Euler at this point in my life. He's like, okay, fine. e to the i pi plus 1 is 0. <laughs> okay, using Euler's formula and a bit of mathematical at, um, magic that um, I can't think of first name, Sal, Sal Khan, I forgot. Um, the bit, bit of mathematical magic that you can watch on Khan Academy if you wanted to gives us these definitions of the hyperbolic functions. Because there is a relationship between trigonometry and e to the x's, the hyperbolic trig functions are defined in terms of e's. Hyperbolic sine is e to the x minus e to the negative x divided by 2. It's just a formula. You need to remember sine and co uh, hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. And the only difference is hyperbolic sine has uh, e to the x minus e to the negative x. Hyperbolic cosine has e to the x plus e to the negative x. You no, know, if you know hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine, you can figure out hyperbolic oh, tangent okay. and hyperbolic cosecant and hyperbolic secant and hyperbolic cotangent. And so if you just remember, hyperbolic sine has a minus, hyperbolic cosine has a plus, 
then you can evaluate all these guys at the bottom. They're just formulas. Yes, you can. Cinch zero. Just put zero in place all of all the x's in the definition of um, hyperbolic sine of x. E to the e to the zero minus e to the negative zero over two would be zero. That's one minus one over two. So hyperbolic sine of zero is zero. Okay. What's hyperbolic cosine of zero? Mm -hmm. E to the zero plus e to the negative zero over two. Two over two, which is one. So at zero radians, um, the hyperbolic sine of zero radians is zero. The hyperbolic cosine of zero is one. What about tanch? If I took, if you pronounce it tanch, uh, zero. It's just sine over cosine, zero over one. Well, I should say hyperbolic sine over hyperbolic cosine. And then what about um, hyperbolic cotangent of zero? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. What about hyperbolic sine of negative one? Do not leave that as your answer. Yeah, that negative exponent and the, the negative exponent means that that whole expression is a complex fraction. So if you multiplied it by e over e to clear out the complex fraction, what would you have? of 2x means, just put 2x wherever there's an x in the original function. So cinch 2x would be e to the 2x minus e to the negative 2x over 2. Just leave it like that. Once I looked down at uh, what I wrote last night, I didn't even, last night I didn't even clean that up in. So I don't, I'm certain that I don't have the understanding that Leonard Boiler has of hyperbolic trig functions, but you give me exponential definitions of those hyperbolic trig functions and I can evaluate them for any angle that, that you want me to evaluate them for. And we're not going to have to graph them, but just so you know, if we did graph them, Here's um, hyperbolic sine. Kind of looks like x cubed. And hyperbolic cosine kind of looks like a parabola. Hyperbolic tangent kind of looks like cube root of x. Hyperbolic cosecant, hyperbolic secant, 
I can call it cotangent. No. I just wanted you to see them. And I also wanted you to see the hyperbolic identities, which are very similar to the um, trigonometric identities, except for, as we saw right here, the first Pythagorean identity for the circular trig functions is cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. For the hyperbolic functions, it's cos squared minus sin squared equals 1. Everything else can be derived from that. Now, I have a note for you as far as what to memorize. If you just, if you just memorize that first one, that cos squared minus sin squared is 1, if you need anything else on the test, I will give it to you. All right? So that takes care of this whole box of identities. If you need any of them other than the first one, I would give it to you. All right, so let's prove the first fundamental identity of the hyperbolic trig functions. That's just one to say. Use the definitions of cinch and cosh to prove that cosh squared minus cinch squared equals one. I can do that. I know that cinch is the one that has a minus in the numerator, cosh is the one that has a plus in the numerator. So cosh squared is e to the x minus, what did I just say? Yeah, plus. Plus e to the negative x over 2 squared. That's cosh squared. Minus cinch. We're proving an identity, so we can work on that left hand side until hopefully it becomes a one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't want to start with the right hand side on this one. Mm, what can I do on the left hand side? Mm, square that, square that, which means I'm going to have to fold the numerator. Mm -hmm. All right. I know that outer, I would have, eh, I'm just going to put it down so I can look at it. E to the x plus e to the negative x times itself. Over four. That's where the denominator also. All right. I'll pull those in the right bit. What does that mean where it gets in that feet? Mm -hmm. Or what is it clean up that's to be?
just four over four. Mm -hmm. Oh. Let's do one more. Number 18. Number 18 says. Which side you'd like to start with? Um, if you started with the left, then you're just going to put x plus y into the definition of the hyperbolic function or sine function. I'm going to show you why I would start with the right. Ah, here's what I'm looking for. Um, if I put x plus y into the hyperbolic sine function, I'd have e to the x plus y minus e to the negative x minus y over 2. And then I wouldn't know much, I wouldn't know what to do with that. Well, we, our general rule for verifying identities was it's easier to start with the ugly side and simplify it than start with the short side and expand it. That's why we didn't start with the one in the previous problem. Yeah. So it's not that we could not start with the left-hand side. We could. My gut just says we can do more with the right-hand side. So I would start with cinch x harsh y plus cos x sinh y and work and work and work and hope it came out to be sine of x or sinh of x plus y. All right. What is sinh x? So good. Mm -hmm. All right. 
for the numerators in the first term, for the numerators in the last term, and let's see what we get. When I multiply those last terms, I'm just saving myself one step here. When I multiply the last terms of the numerators in the first term, I could write it negative x minus y. I'm thinking it might be helpful to have negative times x plus y, because then I have an e to the ugly and an e to the negative ugly. second numerators. What all happens in that numerator? Everybody got all eight terms in the numerator? Oh. Okay, I'll be quiet for a minute then. I'll be quiet. stuff cancels in the mm -hmm. e to the x minus y and the negative e to the x minus y. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ugly plus ugly is too ugly no matter what the ugly is. Are. Terms in the numerator canceled, and then I have one ugly plus one ugly, it's two ugly. Mm -hmm. And negative one ugly minus one ugly is negative two ugly. And if I factor two out of that numerator, 
and cancel it with the 4 in the denominator. I have e to the x plus y minus e to the negative, in parentheses, x plus y over 2. What is that? Cinch x plus y. fun to differentiate no, no. and integrate no. hyperbolic trig functions. What if I tell you that you only, out of the first, out of this box, you only have to remember this one. Out of this whole next box, you only need to remember that the derivative of cinch is cosinch. The derivative of cosinch is cinch. Notice that both are positive. If you need any of the others, I'll give them to you. So, real quickly, how many, I would like to do three, and I think we can. Um, number 26 says if f of x equals cosh of 8x plus 1, This cosh ugly. The derivative of cosh ugly is what? Cinch ugly. I'm ugly prime. Yay! Number 28. Number 31 is going to be the product rule. Number 29, yes, it's going to be this uh, chain rule. But actually, 28, easy, let's do 30. We only have time for one more. 30 is y equals natural log of tinch x over 2. So I take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. That's just natural log of ugly. Mm -hmm. One over ugly. Times the derivative of ugly. That's what the derivative of tinge is. Secret. Hyperbolic secret. Anything else? Um, you just do a little bit of cleaning up there if you write C hyperbolic secant squared as one over um, cosh squared and tinge is cosh root. Oh, no, cinch. You're right. You're right. That's why I wrote that first. Um, since you're dividing, dang it. But this is so me. I messed up the very last. <laughs> it is now.
I'm dividing by tangent. So I'm multiplying by 1 over tangent. You've got to leave it out to produce anything. That denominator, I'm so proud if you got that. That's absolutely fine. But does two sine cosine ring a bell at all? That's the only one of my double angle formulas I have memorized. The sine of uh, 2x is 2 sine x cosine x. So <clears throat> in the back of the book, they will have said in place of 2 cosh cinch is just um, cinch. Oh, that's just feedback, so the two. Mm hmm But we'll probably see what turns out. If that will simplify the I don't even know how you say that guy out loud. <laughs> it's a good one to end on. Um, Miss? I got my paper. I got my paper. Oh, did you? Okay. All right. So nobody needs my paper. Um, the derivatives, exactly what the homework paper says up to 33. So. Figure out why y'all are that in. Oh, because I had a magnetic machine. Oh, one when it was still sitting. Okay, but not the whole class. No, yeah, just, just test one. one. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, the run the college algebra. You're a genius. You're a genius. Tell your dad, but he's just out of peace. My dad probably not the same as I'm talking about. So, how long is that? 11 to 12.